This is an Eye on Annapolis bonus podcast. Hey, for anybody that's listening, first of all, we're going to be talking about a comedy show coming to the Ram's Head on stage on Thursday, September 16th. And because it is a comedy show, that means we're going to probably be talking to a comedian and we're going to say the language might get a little bit off the rails as normal. So if you're offended by that, hey, there's your warning. Fast forward right now. Welcome to Noel Kassler, who will be at the Rams Head on stage Thursday, September 16th for one show at 8 o'clock. Doors will open at 7. Thank you very much for your time today, Noel. How are you? I'm excellent, man. Thanks for having me on, John. I really appreciate it. Before we get into it, everybody needs to go to noelkassler.com, and that's N-O-E-L-C-A-S-L-E-R.com, and check out everything that you've got, the podcast, the Facebook page, the Twitter account, which is amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm just looking forward to seeing you here in Annapolis, Maryland. I understand that you are local. Is that true? Well, I live in New York now, but I'm a Maryland boy. I was born in Chestertown on the other side of the Bay Bridge from Annapolis and uh, grew up in PG County, then went to work in live TV in the music business. So I'm based in New York City, and that's where I live now. But uh, Maryland is in my heart, and I got a ton of family there. They're coming out to the show. And... Funnily enough, you know, I was at the Rams head 10 years ago with Stephen Stills. I worked in the music industry for a long time, and I was the road manager for Crosby, Stills, and Nash. So the last time I was there was 10 years ago, literally almost to the date, because we were doing a solo tour in September. We played the Rams. I'll tell you, you know, actually how I got turned on to you was a, I believe it may have been a childhood friend of yours, but Lisa Clark, who is a follower on our uh on the podcast and everything else, she had sent me a Twitter direct message and said, oh man, Noel Kassler is coming to Ramshead. You need to talk to him. So she hooked us up and here we are today. That's awesome. Shout out to Lisa. Yeah, yeah. she's great. I've worked with her in events because she, she does some production work. And, you know, for people who don't know who I am, for 20 years I worked behind the scenes in live television and music. So I did everything from the Super Bowl show, you know, halftime show for 15 years to the VMAs, the Grammys, all the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductions. And I toured with everyone from the Rolling Stones to Springsteen to Jackson Brown, who recorded Running on Empty down there at Meriwether Post yep. Pavilion. And I worked in live television. And one of my assignments was on The Celebrity Apprentice, where I took care of the Trump family on the finales for six seasons. We definitely need to talk a little bit about that a little bit as we get into it. But you said six seasons with them. Yeah, six seasons, you know, and taking care of Ivanka, who I call Vonky, you know, <laughs> and it was nuts. But nobody at the time thought he was becoming president, you know, so it was kind of like any other entertainment gig. You know, there's a lot of crazy stuff you see behind the scenes that it's your job to just sort of keep it behind the scenes. That's what happens when you work with talent, you know, and I've worked with everyone from Madonna to Michael Jackson, like, you know, and with Trump, you'd sign an NDA because they really wanted to keep some of the stuff secret, which is understandable. It's a little unusual, but, but not that unusual. But then he became president. So I was like, you know what? I'm breaking that NDA because some of the stuff I saw was pretty nefarious and it wasn't what you would want in a leader. And I'm not even talking about politics. You know, my politics are no secret. I'm pretty progressive, but I just kind of wanted to warn people and was like, you know what? I'm just going to put this in my stand up routine. Let them judge it how they want to judge it. But it's all true, <laughs> you know. And unfortunately, the things I was trying to warn people about came to fruition. You know, because I was kind of telling people, like, look, this guy's out of his mind, and he's the last person you want in charge of this country, okay? I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. I'm telling you, this is not the dude you want when a crisis happens. And, and obviously a crisis happened, and it got mismanaged, right, to the yeah. tune of the industry getting shut down and a lot of Americans losing their lives. So that basically what I was warning people about came true. And... You know, it's a scary time we live in, but the stuff I comment on, you know, I try to do it comedically, not making fun of the heavy situation, but someday we're all going to have to come back together, you know, and we're going to have to start focusing on what we have in common more than what divides us. Well, that's true. It's funny. You say you talk about it in a comic way. And, you know, as I've heard some of your bits, I've done the YouTube thing and everything else. And obviously I've not seen you in person. I'm looking forward to it, but I get this whole, and, and I really hate to compare artist and say, oh, you just sound like so-and-so, but this guy's already dead, and he, so I'll say it, but I, getting George Carlin, I mean, you're getting that kind of a vibe. It's no bullshit. It's unvarnished. It's cynical and skeptical of the system, and is that all really driven by the election of Trump for you? It, well, 
Yeah, and I couldn't couldn't be a higher compliment. So thanks for saying that. I'm not worthy. I do get that a comparison a lot. <laughs> not to not that I'm worthy of it. You know what I mean? But that that's probably the vein of comedy that I'm in. And I saw Carlin when I was in high school. You know, I saw him in a theater. So yeah, it wasn't just Trump. That that's sort of how my thinking goes. You know, I worked with progressive artists. Jackson Brown was a mentor to me. I met him when I was 17. You know, as I said, I toured with Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I toured with Springsteen. So a lot of my heroes in the arts were guys that were kind of calling it like it is, you know, and saying, hey, don't believe everything you're told right away. You know what I mean? Kind of see who's behind the scenes pulling the strings here. And that was certainly a theme in Carlin's work, you know, because he'd be like, look, they want you dumb. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're not the one who's benefiting from these policies, you know, and we've never had a greater example of that than now. The guys that are telling people not to take the vaccine and get masked are getting vaccines themselves. <laughs> you know, you got to be vaccinated to walk into Fox News headquarters on Sixth Avenue in New York City. Right. But yep. Sean Hannity is on TV telling you not to get the vax, you know, and not to wear a mask. So you have to question why that happens. And, you know, a lot of times artists like Carlin and comedians are almost the best people to call this stuff out, you know, because, you know, we can cut through the BS. You know, I'm not a journalist. You know, I can just say what I want and I don't have to worry about lawyers at my network, <laughs> you know, <laughs> saying you can't say that we're going to get sued, you know, to bring it back to the NDA thing. With Trump, my colleagues wouldn't speak out because they wanted to work again. Mark Burnett was like, I'm going to sue anybody who tells what we saw. Because, I mean, the dude snorted Adderall. That's not a joke. He would do it on set. You know, he, he was out of his mind. And Mark Burnett was like, you guys better not tell this story when he was running for president. And somebody I worked with actually on Obama's, President Obama's inaugurations was now at Hillary's campaign. And she called me up and said, no, would you mind talking to Hillary's campaign and telling them what you know? And I did. And they put me in touch with People Magazine and some press outlets. And I told them my story. And the stories didn't come out in October of 16. Because news agencies were like, you know what? He's probably not going to win, and we don't want the hassle of touching this stuff. And oh. then, of course, he won. So yeah. I said, you know what? I'm cutting out the mainstream media. I'm just going to get on stage and say my piece. If you want to listen, you can. You know, I got nothing to prove. I don't care if people necessarily believe me, but I have to speak to the truth as I see it because it's affecting the country I love in a really negative way. You know, and I grew up in Maryland. I grew up in PG in a multiracial neighborhood outside of the University of Maryland in like Hyattsville, Maryland in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, my friends were from Central America, from the Middle East. You know, they were African-American kids. We all played and got along. And it's almost like it feels like we've gone backwards as a country. We have. And people demonizing immigrants and stuff like that. Like, I'm not going to stand for that. You know, America is made great by all of us. And we all deserve an equal opportunity at success and a happy life, you know, and, and somebody who's trying to keep you from that for their own political gains in a cynical way, as I see many politicians on the right doing now. I'm going to speak out against it, man. You know, I'm not going to believe that you're telling me it's a threat. That's not a threat. Immigrants aren't a threat. They're coming here to work hard and raise their kids in a safe way. Since when is that un-American? I, I I can't agree with you anymore. I can't agree with you anymore. And and it's funny, you're talking about telling it like it is and whatnot. I mean, it's not too dissimilar for Hannibal Burris and Bill Cosby. I yeah, mean, it, you know, and I knew Bill Cosby. You know. I, I worked on a ton of shows. Last time I saw Bill Cosby was down in D.C., actually, when he got the Mark Twain Prize at the Kennedy Center. Right. They give a prize out every year. It's a TV show. And, like, that that's what I was saying earlier about Trump. Like, it was not a secret that Bill Cosby was a predator. Every comedian knew that, and, and nobody would say anything. I used to go watch them tape the Cosby show. When I was in high school, I moved to New York and, and would watch them tape that show in Brooklyn. And you could tell Cosby was an asshole back then. <laughs> you know what I mean? You were just like, he was not like the father, you know, like that you saw Dr. Huxtable. Like, he, there was something off about the guy. And, uh, yeah, and Hannibal had the same reaction. He was like, look, I'm just saying this on stage. He wasn't out to take down Bill Cosby. He was just like, I'm telling you my truth. You know, that guy rapes people. He drugs them and rapes people. So yeah. you want a comedian who's going to tell you the truth. You don't want somebody who's not really... 
passionate about what they're saying. I, I make it funny because I think laughter heals us, and I think we've all been through trauma as a nation, you know, and even coming out and going to shows now is a baby steps type thing, and we have to make sure it's a safe environment, which we're doing. Obviously, I'm vaccinated and stuff. I wear a mask when I go out, but... It's like we need to come together and we need to listen to each other in a way where we're, we're unafraid to speak our truth and we can do it in a way that could involve laughter. It, it can't be screaming at school board meetings, you know, it can't be disrupting the thing because the worst thing you can do to a people is divide them. And what I saw in Trump and new in Trump, like he was always a con man. He was a Democrat when I worked for him, by the way. Right. OK, he only switched to the Republican Party after Barack Obama got elected because he's a racist. And he was just like, well, I'm going to be a Republican now. But he doesn't have ideals. He's not a conservative per, per se. And I got no problem with old school conservatism. There's a place for that. You used to have checks and balances for a reason. You wanted two sides of the debate to make sure you kind of put things down the middle. But. He's a con man and an opportunist, and he, he benefits from dividing this country. And there's just too much of it now. We can't be divided. Ultimately, it's like the right hand fight, fighting the left. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we're part of the same organism. We can't be at each other's throats forever. We're going to have to come together. So you want a comedian who sort of understands that, I think, and is unafraid to say his truth, even though it might be popular. I have peers who are like, look, I'm not doing political stuff because half my audience might be MAGA, you know? And look, I get that, but that's not me. <laughs> you know, like, if you don't want to hear me tell the truth about what or how I see it, don't come and see me. You know, I'm not saying you're an idiot for believing this stuff necessarily, though I may say that in a comedic way. You know, uh, what I'm saying is, like, you better look deeper at what you're being told because this guy doesn't have your best interest at heart. And none of them do. Did all of your material dry up when... You know, on January 21st? I mean, no, obviously, obviously, I'm, obviously I'm, Trump is somewhat the gift that keeps on giving to a comedian. But <laughs> Absolutely. God, I wish it did. Okay? Because that's a great question, John. Because, like, you know, I did the Trump stuff. Obviously, it's been ad nauseum for three years, and I wanted to retire it. I actually sent a tweet. I think the morning of the, the, the election was getting certified. I was watching it. On, and I used to work on Capitol Hill, by the way. As a young man, I worked on Capitol Hill when I was 18 to about 21. So when I was watching that morning of the election getting certified, I sent out a tweet and I said, I'm not gonna mention Trump again. Like, that's it, I did my service. I got plenty of other stuff to, to write material about. As I said, I toured with rock bands, you know? Right. I could do an hour on Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Like, that's like hurting three stoned cats <laughs> all the time. You know what I mean? Like, it was nuts. I was on the tour they broke up on in 2015. It was me that basically caused the breakup because I gave a pass to a groupie who ended up falling in love with Graham Nash. And, uh... And it divided the band in a way. It was a long story, but there's a lot of material that I could talk about. You know, I worked with Michael Jackson. I, you know, I had an interesting life myself. I was looking to put the political Trump stuff down, and then that afternoon happened. You saw what yeah. happened on January 6th. And, and now it's like he's more popular than ever. Yes, he's not in power, but what he spawned has multiplied. You have your Ron DeSantis, your Governor Abbott, your Marjorie Taylor Greene, who just called President Biden a piece of SI, right. SHIT yesterday. Like, she's a member of Congress. How is she putting out videos saying this about our leaders? And what is that doing to the next generation? So that's why I keep speaking out, because what I'm really worried about now is the kids that are growing up in these households you know, that are listening to the sort of mean-spirited propaganda of your OANs, your Fox News, your QAnons. Like, we're going to have to deal with that generation of kids. You know, the people that did see the folks that attacked the Capitol as patriots. And it's, part, it's all part of the same con. As I said, Trump is doing this stuff to raise money. He's just doing it to keep grifting so he can tell his supporters, he can send them texts and say, donate $50, help me get reinstated. He's not getting right. reinstated. <laughs> yeah, well, I went down for the inauguration yesterday and or last week and there was nothing happening. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, exactly. He's up here in Bedminster. He's on his <laughs> golf course. He's a scammer. He's from Fifth Avenue. How did these people believe that? What I'd always tell people, like, the dude would not be caught dead with the followers that support him. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I used to do the beauty pageants with him in the 90s, and we would shoot them in his casinos, right? right? And he used to have his security walk with him in case any of the ladies that he bust in from, like, Ohio to play his slot machines would get up and try and, like, shake his hand or something. Like, he wanted nothing to do with the people. He wants to be, like, an elitist East Coast celebrity type, and he was sort of rejected from that world, and that's a lot of what drives him too, is this narcissism, you know? Oh, I'm sure. Do you think he's going to win again, or do you think he's going to run again? I do. I, I do. I actually think it, it's, it's quite dangerous. My take right now would be that he'll say he's running so he can get a piece of the money, so he can continue to raise money off of the idea of him being president again, and it'll also insulate him a little bit against any further criminal charges that might come his way, because he'll be able to say, hey, they're just trying to go after me because they don't want me to be president again. You know what I right. mean? So he'll say he's going to run. He'll stay in the race. I think at the last minute, he'll hand it off to somebody like Ron DeSantis and, I, and for a piece, for a fee. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I think that <laughs> you know, be like, I get a cut of everything, but you because he never wanted to be president. That's the thing. Like the guy didn't show up into the Oval Office until noon every day. Right. He lived upstairs. <laughs> you know, right. they called it executive time. And, and, and that's what I was warning people about. I saw it on The Apprentice. Like he would show up for maybe an hour a day. Most days he would cancel tapings. Right. You could barely get an hour out of him. We had to edit everything together because he's incoherent half the time. Like, he really does snort Adderall. That's not a joke. He's, like, in active addiction. That's why he's sniffing all the time when you see him giving speeches and stuff. So he was, like, a mess back then. We're talking 10 years ago, he was a mess and lazy. The guy's never worked in his life. He spends his life on the golf course. And he spent his presidency on the golf course. Obviously, another way to grift money, because the club could charge the Secret Service and stuff. So... My point is he doesn't want to be president. He hated that job. He's not a guy who really reads or even knows how to read. Right. So, like, you know, he doesn't have any interest in being there again because I think he thought it was really confining. And he doesn't like having Secret Service and stuff around because he is kind of doing so much shady stuff all the time. But I think he wants the power and he wants to wield that power over his followers and the GOP. So. That's my guess, is that he hands it off to Ron DeSantis in the 11th hour, and then it becomes really dangerous, right? Because Ron DeSantis went to Harvard, went to Yale, went to Navy JAG school. He was the, the, the Navy JAG at Guantanamo Bay advising like what, how to torture the prisoners. He was a Navy JAG in terms of the, yep. the Navy SEALs and the Fallujah surge in Iraq. So he's tactical and he's smart. You see what he's doing in Florida now. He has no qualms about using children as pawns to further his political gains and his pocketbooks with Regeneron. So get a guy like that in the presidency and it's almost game over for our democracy. Because the one thing that was working in our favor was Trump was that he was an idiot. He would always kind of give away the game, if you, and he would tweet and say stupid stuff. Imagine if you had a guy who was disciplined, who did all the crazy stuff Trump did, but like had the sense to stay off of Twitter and stay out of the public eye for the most part. He could have done a lot of stuff behind the scenes that you wouldn't be able to necessarily defend against True. in the way we kind of were able to oust Trump, you know, because he, he trips over himself. Well, I'll tell you, you are here on September 16th, which is a Thursday night, and it is a school night, so I suggest that you go in late to school and go see the show for sure. What do we expect out of this show? I know I've been a little heavy-handed on this interview. A lot going on in the country right now. As we all know, it's a crazy week in the news. But, you know, get to know me a little bit. And I want to interact with the audience, and I'm going to tell a lot of stories from, from the music stuff. Because the music stuff was funny and a big part of my life. And I'm actually, I'll tell the story of when Stephen and I did that show at the Rams head. Because it was, Stephen was mad at Neil Young because Neil Young had just pulled out of the Buffalo Springfield tour. So we went from playing arenas to playing great clubs like the Rams head. <laughs> but it was an adjustment for Stephen. So I want to let people know what it's like behind the scenes on a tour bus and laughs like that. And then I'll talk about the current events and things like that. And we'll get everybody laughing, eating some crab cakes, having some good beers and having a good evening. That sounds like a plan. Hey, you spent the bulk of your career, we'll say, behind the lens or behind the mic. And now you're in the front of it. 
What, do you have a preference? Do you like one over the other? You know, I loved being behind the scenes because it's a really cool world that most people don't get to see. And it's almost like when you're watching a show or a concert, in many ways, the artist that you're seeing is the hood ornament on a vehicle of a lot of other skilled professionals that go into making that happen. From sound guys to guitar techs to cameramen on TV shows. And that's a wonderful thing to be a part of because it's a team, right? And everybody's working for the greater good. Much like what I was saying about this country. You know, we need to come together and work for the whole. During World War II, 20-year-old women were going and working in shipyards, learning how to weld underwater for the war effort, right? And right. now we, like, got to talk people into putting on masks. It feels better to do something for the greater good. So I liked being part of a team and being part of a crew and being behind the scenes. That being said, it does feel good to get behind the microphone because I got something to say. Now's my time to say it. I'm saying it in a way that hopefully will, will make people think, and it'll also make them laugh. So it's where I need to be right now, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. And it's going to be a privilege to perform for you Thursday, October 16th, Ram's Head. Well, I'll tell you, with the demise of the Capitol Steps, which was the D.C. political improv thing that pulled no punches for no matter what party you were in, you know, I could say, you know, hey, thank God we got Noel Kasler to fill in the uh, fill in the cracks here that are... <laughs> That are, Absolutely, yeah. That are and to, I, those guys were incredible. Capital Steps were incredible. Oh. I came from improv too. I did UCB up in New York and stuff, and those oh. guys are legends. Well, Noel Kassler will be at the Ramshead on stage Thursday, September sixteenth. Doors will open at seven. The show is at eight o'clock. This is going to be an incredible show. Check out his stuff on YouTube off of his website, noelkasler.com, N-O-E-L-C-A-S-L-E-R.com. You can get your tickets at Ramshead on stage and. I will definitely see you there. And when I do get there, I will make sure that I introduce myself because I always like to put a face with a voice. And I appreciate your time for this afternoon. Dude, thanks for having me on, John. It was awesome talking to you, man. I look forward to seeing you there. The mayor's office is coming. It's going to be a really fun night. Oh, so there goes the definitely. room. Definitely. There goes the room. <laughs> it's the woman, though, who's the publicity. She's a, she's a spokeswoman for the town of Annapolis, and she's very cool. <laughs> Mitchell Stevenson. Is that who it is? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. Oh, okay, that's awesome. She sent a nice tweet about me and stuff, so I'm looking forward to meeting everybody. That's the cool thing about Annapolis. When I was there with Stills, your former governor came to the gig and then came on our tour bus afterwards. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, lo I do love Annapolis. I'm not kissing up here. I grew up going there. I was just there for the 4th of July a couple of years ago. Cool. It's a great town, and I can't wait to get back down there, man. This has been a bonus podcast from Eye on Annapolis. Please visit us at ionanapolis.net. Follow us on Facebook at All Annapolis and on Twitter at Ionanapolis. And if you haven't subscribed to the Daily News Brief podcast, go for it. And all of your local news will be delivered to your phone, tablet, or smart device by 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday.